Hello and welcome to the session on Nietzsche and Existential Philosophy. In the first chapter on Existentialism, we are introduced to Existentialism. We also found how the 19th century philosophers Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche were influential in inducing the existential philosophy among the Western thinking. In this chapter, we will discuss the philosophy of Nietzsche in greater detail so as to understand the issue of existentialism and its indebtedness to Nietzsche's prepositions. Nietzsche was one of the most important modern European thinkers. He was not just a philosopher. By training, he was a classical philologist, someone who is interested in the texts from the classical languages Latin and Greek. He also wrote poetry, composed music and generally written on most of the contemporary issues in his own aphoristic style. In his writings, he questioned the basic tenets of traditional Western philosophy in its attitude towards morality and religion. Nietzsche was born on 15th October 1844 in Rocken near Leipzig in Germany. He registered for classical philology and theology in the University of Bonn, but later turned his concentration completely into philology. Probably this is the time when he has turned to critically looked at faith and religion. He met many of his long-time associates and friends during his student dates. Most important among them was his professor Frederick Wilhelm Rishi. With him moved to the University of Leipzig which was an important intellectual center during the time. Upon reading other Schopenhauer's works, Nietzsche became very much interested in the philosophical thinking. Schopenhauer was known for his clarity of thought and the typical pessimism. Though Nietzsche was influenced by Schopenhauer in his writing style and his philosophy, one would not say that the same thing about the clarity of thought. Nietzsche has never been famous for the clarity of thought. We shall also add that Nietzsche's interest in the working of will also has its roots in Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer believed that humans are motivated only by their own will. It should also be mentioned that it was Nietzsche's interest in Schopenhauer which made him friends with Richard Wagner, the famous music composer from Germany who went on to become another influence in his work. The other lasting impression on Nietzsche was of Frederick Albert Lane. Lane's understanding of materialist philosophy and other discussions on the scientific thought brought in Nietzsche a general rebellion against authority and tradition. Nietzsche became a professor of philology at the University of Basel at the age of 24 in the year 1869. He started publishing around the same time he started teaching. The period from 1879 to 1889 could be considered as the most productive years of Nietzsche's career. He published Daybreak, The Gay Signs, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Beyond Good and Evil and On the Genealogy of Morals. The most important work during the early period of his writing career is undoubtedly The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music published in the 1872. The most important argument in the book is about the division between the Apollonian and Dionysian elements in the ancient Greek mythology. The general dichotomy is found followed by most of the western thinkers following on the story that Apollo is the god of the sun and Dionysius the god of the wine, though both of them are the sons of Zeus, the father of gods and men. Nietzsche argues that the Apollonian elements of reason, logic and order have overtaken the western thinking and that the Dionysian elements of instinctual and creative forces 
have to be combined with the Apollonian ones for a better alternative in the contemporary world. Hesiod's example of German music, especially of Wagner, to prove his position. Daybreak, which carries the subtitle Thoughts on Moral Prejudices, elaborated Nietzsche's critic of Christian morality. The problem with Christian morality, according to him, is that the concepts of sin and afterlife through which the Christians analyze moral experience are actually given much larger significance than they actually deserve. These ideas are further developed and they are a recurrent theme in Nietzsche's writing. It is in Daybreak where for the first time his style of aphoristic writing gains the persuasive power to engage with the reader. The particular style that Nietzsche brought in his writing was typical in its engagement with the readers. They are kindled not to completely persuaded by his own ideas but encouraged to adopt their own points of view by engaging with their own reflections. Nietzsche's major books. Nietzsche uses the phrase God is dead for the first time in the gay signs. However, the book presents a much more serious engagement with the existential themes and goes beyond the obvious atheistic aspirations. He is not just interested in debunking the other's beliefs here. His most important suggestion in the gay science is to celebrate the current life and not to worry too much about afterlife. Instead of worrying about the religious myth of the afterlife, an aesthetic appreciation of this life is much more rewarding. The spoke Saratustra is Nietzsche's most famous book. The book is written in a fictional form. It describes the emergence of Prophet Zarathustra from his mountain cave. Upon coming down the mountain, he starts addressing the sun and starts his teachings. This fictional prophet is modeled after the Persian prophet of the same name who was the founder of Zoroastrianism. Nietzsche considers Zoroastrianism as an alternative to Christian world view which he describes as good and evil. The style of the book varies from time to time. There are chapters where he parodies Plato's dialogues. There are other stanzas where he mimics the New Testament. Nietzsche's idea of the Superman that is Ubermensch find its first mention in Das Spoke Zarathustra. However, he does not go on to develop this idea in this book. He attempts to contrast the Ubermensch to the last man, the human type whose sole aim is personal happiness. According to him, the last man who was incapable of the desire that is required to create beyond oneself in any form. For a deeper understanding of Nietzsche's ideas on Ubermensch, we will have to read his other books. The spoke Zarathustra, however, proposes this world as opposed to any other future world. Zarathustra claims in one of his speeches, Let your will say, the Ubermensch shall be the meaning of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of otherworldly hopes. This is, in fact, a major existentialist claim. The other recurrent theme of the will to power also makes its first appearance in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Beyond good and evil, prelude to a philosophy of the future, attempts a revaluation of values. Nietzsche's trial here is a critic of modernity. The modernity is viewed here as the culture broadly construed. His major contention is with the direction of philosophy and its role in future history. Hence, the subtitle Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. He starts of criticizing traditional philosophy and its presuppositions. 
Nietzsche attacks the dogmatism of philosophers. He questions the very foundation of philosophy and criticizes the notion that philosophy seeks the truth. Philosophers, he argues, were not presenting objective truth. They were presenting some personal and unconscious confession. The future philosophy should not be written by philosophical laborers but by free-spirited experimentalists. And the conscience of the philosopher should be clear and should strive for the overall development of humanity. Toward the genealogy of morals, a polemic is structured in the form of three detailed essays in an argumentative style. Nietzsche goes on to describe how the good is discussed as something which maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain. The problem is that whoever attempts an analysis of good is bound to describe oneself much more than any empirical truth about good. Nietzsche feels that the individual's specific understanding of the term good mostly depends on whether she or he represents the perspective of the master or that of the slave. This dichotomy is present in all the writings about good. If one writes about good one, it's essentially talking about one's own self and its qualities. The bad are those which differ from these qualities. Historically, this master-slave dichotomy is present in most of the analysis of the good. Adding that Christian morality is structured as a form of slave morality, Nietzsche goes on to analyze the Christian moral view point in detail. The suffering and guilt that is central to Christian morality could be seen in this light as well. Major ideas, the overman, God and his death. Nietzsche's concept of Übermensch has to be discussed at length here. It was a very contentious idea for various reasons. There are several possible English translations for the word. Some translators have used the word superman. Others have used overman. Another translation was higher man. The word Superman could not be used for the obvious association it makes with the cartoon character. Moreover, Uber in German has several layers of meanings. Hence, a non-translation is an impossibility. The other problem with this concept is that there have been criticisms that this idea has created a rather racially charged movement led by Adolf Hitler. As it was about a superhuman, the Nazis had ideologically developed the same kind of spirit to invoke hatred against Jews during the Hitler's reign. As is already discussed in this unit, the first reference to Overman could be seen in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The concept of Übermensch is associated with the theory of the eternal recurrence. He considers it as the highest formula of affirmation that can possibly be attained. The importance Nietzsche attached to these ideas is visible in his Thus Spoke Zarathustra. To Nietzsche, this abomination appear as symbols of repudiation of any conformity to a single norm as antithesis to mediocrity and stagnation. We know from Nietzsche's own life that he had also tried to break with conformity in order to realize his own unique individuality. In doing so, he had examples from the Greeks who had envisaged their ideal individualities in their ubermension. In the first speech of Zarathustra, he begins, I teach you the ubermension. Man is something that should be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? The man who is capable of overcoming man is overman. Overman is someone who overcomes the pettiness of mundane life. He has to overcome his animal nature, organize the chaos of his passions, sublimate his impulses and his give style to his character. He has to discipline himself to wholeness. He has to create himself and become the man of tolerance 
not from weakness but from strength. He has to become a spirit who has become free. Nietzsche's concept of God is part of a larger wave of critical engagement with religion prevalent during the 19th century. We see Soren key God philosophically and theologically attacking the contemporary practice of Christianity, Charles Darwin proposing a newer thesis about the evolution of human beings as opposed to biblical notations of the origin of man and Karl Marx criticizing religion for the being and opium which makes people drowsy. Nietzsche should be viewed against these propositions as well. However, his philosophical and aphoristic claim that God is dead had more repercussions than any of the other thinkers. For Nietzsche to have lost God means madness. When mankind will discover that it has lost God, universal madness will break out. This sense of dreadful things to follow hangs over Nietzsche's thinking like he is a prophet of the end of the world. He says, we have destroyed our own faith in God. Once we do that, the only thing which remains is the void. We are falling. Our dignity is gone. Our values are lost. This sense of the utter bleakness of life and the devaluation of all values, which is the immediate consequence of the modern loss of faith in God, is not easy to be justified without proper philosophical background. To make sense of this bleak prediction, we need to properly understand Nietzsche's approach to nihilism as well. To escape nihilism, which seems involved both in asserting the existence of God and thus robbing this world of ultimate significance and also in denying God and thus robbing everything of meaning and value, that is Nietzsche's greatest and most persistent problem. If we look at these statements without dwelling on the philosophical premise on which he builds these arguments, it would be easy for us to consider him an atheist. Some critics have pointed out that this atheism is only directed at the narrow-minded Christians from his provincial hometown or the ones anywhere in the world. But Nietzsche's atheism has to be understood within his commitment to question all premises and to reject them unless they are for some reason inescapable. If you look closely at Nietzsche's consistent engagement with Jesus Christ in his article like Antichrist, it is clear that much like Soren Kierkegaard, it is the organized church as it is the practice in his age and not the concept of God that he had a problem with. Nietzsche repudiates the state of mind and the moral attitudes that seem to him inseparably connected with the Christian faith. He understands that the illusion of God confers a kind of equality in human beings. Everyone is equal in front of God, but human beings are capable of higher order life by negating God. Hence, he attacks Christianity for it does not promote the equality in front of God but proposes a morality which is based on afterlife and the concept of sin. Nietzsche's Existentialism Nietzsche believed that every human being is by the very nature unique. Most people fail to hear the voice of their true self for two reasons, either because of fear or laziness. Both keep people from heeding the call to achieve culture and thus to realize oneself. We are afraid of social retaliation and do not dare to be our own unique selves. It is for this reason that the state becomes the adversary in Nietzsche's ethics. The state intimidates its subject into conformity and thus tempts and coerces one to betray the proper destiny. Man's task is simple. He should cease letting his existence be a thoughtless accident. Not only the use of the word existence, but this thought suggests that it is close to what is today called existentialist philosophy. Man's fundamental problem is to achieve true existence instead of letting his life be no more than just another accident. 
we find these ideas repeated in the spoke Zarathustra and in the gay signs. We find his existential philosophy further developed in his distinction between self and true self. He asked the important questions, what does your consign say and that you shall become who really are. He maintains this conception till his last work which is appropriately titled How One Becomes What One Is. In this meditation, Nietzsche assumes that we must recognize our true self before we can realize it, although interception does not reveal it. The most revealing question is, what have you really loved till now? The answer will show you your true self does not lie deeply concealed within you, but immeasurably high above you, or at least above what you usually take for your ego. As we contemplate our self-chosen educators and meditate upon the dearest features of those we have elected from millions past and present to help us shape ourselves, we envisage our true nature which we would realize if we were not too lazy and afraid. In this sense, he is considered the master philosopher who has paved the way for the later existentialist philosophers. Let us recollect the major points we have discussed in this topic. In this unit, we looked at the contributions of Frederick Nietzsche, the 19th century philosopher, to the later philosophy of existentialism. Through a basic summary of all the major works by Nietzsche, we attempted to understand his major philosophical engagements. We also dealt with the major ideas of Nietzsche in his approach to the death of God and our man. Now, let me give you some questions to work out. Why would you say that Nietzsche's concept of God is part of a larger wave of engagement with religion prevalent during the 19th century? What is essence and why is it that existence is more important than essence according to Sartre? What is the relationship between self and the crowd according to existentialism? Why is existentialism cynical about science? What is the problem with the term atheistic existentialism? Here are some books for you reference. A Companion to Nietzsche, Pearson Keith Ansel, Oxford Blackwell, 2006. Frederick Nietzsche. Spingsley, London and New York, Rutledge, 2003. Nietzsche's Ethics and His War on Morality, May Simon, Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1999. Hope that you enjoyed this topic. See you next time. Take care.